about that in the next uh, hour, so stay tuned. Let me talk about dairy brownfield for a second here, because dairy fought the farmers' battles, all of them. He was brilliant. He was a farmer himself, and he did a radio talk show. He was loved by so many people, and he is missed by so many people. And a lot of you have already said thank you for even addressing Derry Brownfield. Well, let me give you his words on the land issue because he fought it, and he worked for those people that were being attacked. And he says, now this is in one of his writings, and we'll put this in the email blast. I feel like he's talking to us from heaven. Gary said, I consider Wayne Hage one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. Wayne Hage, by the way, Pine Valley Ranch, 1979, he dealt with the same thing of the government wanting his property. On our very first visit, he was explaining the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, how the world bankers planned on collateralizing the world debt with land, not just the United States national debt, but also the world debt. A listener sent me a copy of the report of the Fourth World Wilderness Congress, which, he, which was held in Denver in 1987. Over 1,500 people from 60 countries were told that wilderness lands were to protect the reindeer, the spotted owl, and other endangered species. Ninety percent of the group consisted of conservationists, ecologists, government, and United Nations bureaucrats. The other 10% were world banking heavyweights, such as David Rockefeller of Chase Manhattan Bank, London banker Edmund de Rothschild, and the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, James Baker, who gave the keynote address. George Hunt, an investment counselor, served as official host, said in the meetings it was George Hunt that wrote the report from which I have gleaned much of his information of Derry's information that he writes in this. During the first three days, the group was told that the Wilderness Congress was about beating the ozone deterioration and bringing rainforests back. The following days were closed to the public. With only the bankers in attendance, the topics discussed centered on the creation of a World Conservation Bank, with collateral being derived from receipt of wilderness properties throughout the world. This bank would have central bank powers similar to the Federal Reserve. It would create currency and loans and engage in international discounting, counter trade, barter, and swap actions. Rothschild personally conducted the monetary matters and the creation of this World Conservation Bank. This bank would refinance by swapping debt for assets. A country with a huge national debt would receive money to pay off the debt by swapping the debt for wilderness lands. The plan was to swap $1 trillion of third world debt into this new bank. In the long term, when the countries won't be able to pay off the loans, the governments from around the world will give title to their wilderness lands to the bankers. George Hunt wrote, title to the lands will go to the World Wilderness Land Inventory Trust. This trust will float into the World Conservation Bank by the unanimous decree of the world's people saying, God bless you for saving our reindeer. Those people at the Congress were ignorant. They don't suspect anything. They're very naive, not stupid, but ignorant. And I'm talking about the 90% that were not the world banking heavyweights. I can just hear Derry saying these words. Hunt goes on to say the World Bank loans, as they stand now, are not collateralized. They're saying we want collateral, so when we loan swap this debt, we're going to own the Amazon if you default. They're going to make their bad loans good by collateralizing them with the fact, with all of this land, and somebody is going to end up with a title to 12.5 billion acres. They have multiple trillions of dollars upon which they can create currencies and loans, and they're going to begin to barter and counter trade and loan swap against the United States. The World Conservation Bank is a scheme to monetize land. This <clears throat> will function as a world central bank, and out of the bank, there will grow a one world fiat currency. Now, this isn't some scheme conjured up by the Bush and Clinton administration. 
The United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development was created in 1982. The commission published the Brunt Land Report, the R-U-N-D-T, L-A-N-D report, setting the stage for unlimited enactments to take over ecology, environmental pollution laws throughout the world. The report stated, we will have a proposal for very harsh quasi-spiritual ecological laws for Mother Earth. A Mother Earth comes first. Mentality will arise throughout the world. Now, when James Baker made his keynote speech in 1987, he stated that no longer will the World Bank carry the debt unsecured. The only assets we have to collateralize are federal lands and national parks. Baker's definition of federal lands includes heritage sites, of which there are about 20 in the United States. And I say about 20 because they're being added on a regular basis. As Derry wrote this article, Congress was about to vote on a proposal, proposed rim of the Valley National Park that would include over 500 thousand acres of national forest land and 170,000 parcels of private property, including many farms and ranches. At the same time, there is a bill before Congress called the North, Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act that would increase the acreage of designated wilderness by 50% in the lower 48 states. While our heritage sites take in quite a large amount of territory, such as Yellowstone National Park and Mesa Verde, the Grand Canyon and the Everglades, other countries have much greater areas. Brazil, for example, has the Amazon Conservation Complex, and Canada has the Canadian Rocky Mountain Parks. And as Derry says, as I write this story, the list includes 851 properties in 141 countries, comprising over one-third of the Earth's land mass. Will all this land collateralize the world debt? Probably not. So what happens? Along comes the NAIS, the National Animal Identification System. And according to the United States Department of Agriculture, the first step in implementing a national animal identification system is identifying and registering the premises that are associated with the animal agricultural industry. In terms of the NAIS, a premise is any geographically unique location in which agricultural animals are raised, held, or boarded. Under this definition, farms, ranches, feed, yards, auction barns, and livestock exhibitions are fair sites for all examples of premises. That may be the definition of some government bureaucrat will give you, but the word premises, but the word premises, under the International Criminal Court Act 2002, Section 4 states, the word premises includes a place and a conveyance. Why check with the International Criminal Court? Because on June 8, 2007, Under Secretary of Agriculture Bruce Knight, speaking at a World Pork Expo in Des Moines, Iowa, was quoted as saying, We have to live by the same international rules we're expecting other people to do. Now, throughout the entire draft National Animal Identification System User's Guide, land is referred to as a premises and not a property. A premises has no protection under the Constitution of the United States, while property always has the exclusive rights of the owner tied to it. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution protect property rights. The word premise is a synonym for the word tenement. A definition of the world tenement in law is property such as land held by one person leasing it to another. Webster's New World Dictionary 1960 College Edition defines premises as the part of a deed or lease that states its reason, the parties involved, and the property in conveyance. Webster then defines conveyance as the transfer of ownership of real property from one person to another. It is quite obvious that the bureaucrats in Washington have a very good reason to use the term premises and never mention property. Boy, that is excellent. Now, take another look at the wilderness areas and the World Bank's plans to collateralize its loans. While the wilderness areas cover one-third of the Earth's surface, they are wilderness areas for a good reason. 
They have useless or difficult to homestead, farm, or use in a constructive manner. Worldwide, the best and most valuable land is occupied by farmers, ranchers, people with the ambition to produce. Wouldn't the world bankers rather have some productive property besides mountains, deserts, and swamps? He says he is convinced that the word premise will not or will put an encumbrance on your deed. I repeat that. Derry says, I am convinced that the word premise, the word premise will put an encumbrance on your deed. The bankers say they want to monetize land. It's your land and my land they want to monetize. The bankers are in the process of accumulating the wealth of the world. Very few privately owned assets can be termed real wealth. According to scripture, God made Abraham very wealthy, giving him land, cattle, silver, and gold. Genesis 24:35. 4,000 years later, wealth continues to be land, cattle, silver, and gold. I don't know where the world deposits of silver and gold are stored, but I'm sure the bankers have them in their control. That only leaves land and cattle, which I believe could be next on the list. Genesis 47 describes how Joseph had storehouses full of grain to feed the people, but he didn't have a welfare program. During the first year of famine, Joseph took all the money the people had for only one year's supply of grain. The second year, he took all the cattle for another year's supply of grain. The next year, they said... We have nothing left but our bodies and our land. Buy us and our land in exchange for food, and we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Genesis 47, 21 states, And as for the people, he removed them to the cities and made slaves of them. Wow. James Madison made a statement concerning how our people could lose our freedom by gradual and silent encroachment by those in power. It is possible that those in power today are gradually and silently in the process of removing the people to the cities to make slaves of them. Is that possible? Federalizing our land and our cattle would certainly be a step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Derry Brownfield. You know, we're going to have in the email blast the News with Views archives. I can't find the radio archives, but we're going to have the News with Views archives of Jerry Brownfield. He was brilliant and a farmer and a Christian and an incredible human being. We miss him so very much. I want to tell you quickly what happened when Jerry Brownfield called me and said they took my office, they took my business. Jerry was outspoken, as you know, against Monsanto. He had a business in Jefferson City, Missouri called the Lear Brownfield business and they did they broadcast all the sports in the state of missouri high school whatever they broadcast all the sports huge beautiful building out there by the mall huge huge i mean it was just gorgeous you could see it from all around because of the big dishes that were there and Derry did his radio show from there and he was in business with a mr lear It was Lear Brownfield Building and Business. He went in there every day, did his radio show for an hour, and talked against Monsanto. Monsanto came in and said, if you continue to talk what you're talking, then we will take away our advertising monies. Which state of Missouri farm needed it? And Derry was told in no uncertain terms not to talk about Monsanto. Well, as I understand from what Derry told me, for the next week, he talked about Monsanto. They came in again. And he went in the next day after getting another warning, and his office was locked. His key did not work. His own building he had owned for years. His own business he had been involved in was taken away from him. And he called me that day after he got back home. Because I'm close here, and he said, Joyce, let me tell you what just happened. He told me the story, and he said, I have to continue to tell the truth. He said, can I use your studio tomorrow? And I said, absolutely. 
He said, because I have no place to go now. They took my studio. Jerry then developed another studio, opened another studio, which he did his program for another, I think, probably a year or so. He was a broken man. And one day, he would get up in the morning early, and he would go to his prayer couch, his wife told me. He would go to his prayer couch where he would pray every morning. And she went in there and saw him, and she thought he was asleep. But he was gone. In prayer. So, that is Derry Brownfield as we remember him, or as I remember him. You know, I've got to say, I, I used to go up and do our, uh, be a guest on his radio show, and I heard him say one day, well, welcome to Missouri, where we do the one finger wave. And I thought, one finger wave? That reminds, you know, that's, but it's your index finger. And in Missouri, when you're driving down the road, I'll never forget him for saying this. You do the one finger wave to everybody you see. 